focus on the tool based or web servers that are already there which supports uh, free and open source uh, prediction of computational toxicities. So to keep it short, we will have a description on data sets and descriptors of chemical structures, some uh, theoretical concepts to give you an idea how to approach this kind of problems and the tools and and we hope that uh, with this lecture you have uh, you can come up with your innovative idea to solve those problem statements that we have in the drug discovery hackathon so drug discovery um, this is uh, as you can see it's uh, overlaid with corresponding computational approach so traditional drug discovery and development is well known to be time consuming and cost intensive an average 10 to 15 years until it is ready to reach the market. And it's at estimated cost of 58.8 billion USD. So you can understand it's a very time consuming and cost uh, uh, costly process. So what happens in a overall, you screen 10,000 chemical compounds and then you reduce it to almost 250 that go for further clinical testing. And in addition, those are tested in human typically do not exceed more than 10 compounds. This prompted or provided a scope and the need of computational drug discovery. So the process of uh, CAD in short uh, starts with target discovery or in some cases hit identification from the data that is obtained from wet lab. And if you see uh, clearly, most of the problem statement that we have in this drug discovery hackathon fall, you know, falls into uh, this kind of nodes where you have a target discovery related PS, where you have hit identification and lead optimization, where the computational toxicology plays a big role, and uh, also preclinical trials where you evaluate pharmacokinetic properties, and of course, the ultimate is the clinical trials which decide the fate of the compounds in the larger populations, addressing the efficacy and adverse effects. The so typical goal of a CAT is to screen library of compounds against uh, the target of interest, and thereby narrowing the candidates to few smaller clusters. And if I have to go back and, and, and take a perspective to explain what are the different methods or, or group the methods into different perspective then for computational drug discovery, it can be divided into three uh, uh, groups. One is ligand based where you have QSR modeling, computational chemistry, chemical space, cheminformatics, molecular profiling. And uh, then you have the structure based where you have molecular modeling, protein structure prediction, molecular docking and dynamics. And then if you zoom out a little bit, then you have network pharmacology, proteochemometric modeling, pathway analysis from the system-based perspective. Now, all of this are, uh, are important concepts and, and will be taken um, over in the upcoming lecture series uh, by other experts. So uh, sometimes a project might involve both integrating uh, methods and knowledge from all of these nodes, whether from legal and structure, depending on availability of the data, and of course the objective of the problem that you're addressing. Now, if I go a little bit uh, further, then you have a conceptual map and how this experimental and computational methods are applied to drug discovery. Here, the color doesn't signify anything. It's basically to help you go through the nodes and the roadmaps. So if you have in terms of target identification or characterizations, you have starting with biochemical pathways to ending with molecular dynamics. So you have molecular modeling where you are, you know, integrating both ligand based and structure based approaches. And then you have de novo design where you start with a, a, a structure and then you go with chemical search, pharmacophore search, molecular modeling. And then in the heat identifications, you have various aspects of computational chemistry, starting with scaffold hopping, QSR model, quantum mechanics. And when it comes to lead optimizations, uh, you have uh, the concepts of admate and toxicology, uh, which is basically plays a big role there. But depending on what kind of problems you're addressing, so if you are going for drug repurposing, 
then probably you will have more knowledge on the admit properties of the already approved drugs where you're trying to find a new ident- new indication so the in in terms of hit selection you really hit identifications you really need to see the toxicity profile too and i hope that this gives you a good idea how this all methods are correlated and they depending on the nature of the problem that you're going to solve uh, you might take help or you might integrate these methods to solve the problems so toxicology so it's uh, paracelsus was known as the father of modern toxicology uh, he he stated that all substances are poisons and there is none which is not a poison the right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy so as you can see paracelsus understanding of dose dependent toxicity profiles of chemical compounds manifested a new definition in terms of system level understanding of toxicity so from the science of poisons and intoxication toxicology uh, and its scope has broadened and developed with time and currently has been regarded as a science of safety and personalized therapeutic administration so in if i have to tell you what is toxicology at current uh, standard it is a translational science transferring knowledge from basic science into practical applications to safeguard public health and environment so this is a very interdisciplinary science it motivates and encourages people com- coming from different no- domain of science bringing different types of thought processes and method- methods and integrate and work together as a common objective where you work for better and safer drugs for both living systems and chemicals which are safer for environment so you must have noticed that i have put a lot of text on my slides the reason i have done this because we are on a virtual platform the network connectivity is not always great so if you are not able to listen to me or my voice is not audible at some point you still know what's going on by looking at the slides so i hope that's clear So when we talk about toxicology, um, the ADME is an important part. It has to address the chemical impact on he- uh, which are usually investigated by the concept of ADME. This is how a chemical is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, or eliminated in living systems. Not all chemicals are impactful in the same way. So you know there is no generalized way of predicting toxicities. Um, considering all aspects of how chemicals get into the body how they move within the body and how they get out of the body can help us access the toxicity of a chemical so as you can see the problem uh, here is starting from dose dependent to time dependent too so we have several questions that uh, we need to keep in our mind while addressing the problem of toxicity is how much is too much so how much of this uh, chemical compound is Uh, can create a toxic effect in a living cells or living system and how long is too long so for what concentration of time or uh, uh, you know this can result in some adverse effect so uh, toxicity can be both acute and chronic depending on how they result of their time and and dose so just to give you a picture that it's not a binary thing toxic and non toxic you uh, there is a lot of thing that goes in between uh, this end points so why computational toxicology okay toxicity as um, was you know kind of uh, access recently or in primitive way was uh, to do a compound toxicity by performing on laboratory animals they did it for uh, a lot for cosmetics and other food ingredients and so on right now several countries are banned using you know chemical uh, chemical testing on animals and uh, this is a good step because there is ethical concern here and toxicology is important because every marketing uh, products that is chemical based has to go for this kind of assessment uh, this is important from the regulatory prospects and of course uh, its economical prospect is it's time consuming and expensive so you need an alternative and uh, and 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 one of those in alternatives is computational methods of course there are other alternatives like in vitro organ chip and so on but we'll focus on computational methods because we are on computational drug discovery platform so uh, 
what is uh, like any predictive science we need uh, to foresee the future we must consult the past that is we have to have you or use the data that is already there build a model and predict the next uh, feasible outcome um, it also integrates it also allows the integration of previous findings so if you have any other important data that has not been in the model but you can always include them and retrain your model so its reproducibility is faster and 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 can be done um, quicker and um, of course uh, there is a question here uh, there are many things when we do scientific research there are levels of understanding for things that we know and we actually know that we know and it's well defined and there are zone where we we know that we don't know and then there is a third zone where we uh, don't know that we don't know. So <laughs> most of the problems exist in that zone that we don't know what, what is there. So if you're using a data driven approach, you basically come with new ideas and new uh, questions that might be uh, important for addressing and can be validated on experimental research platform. So the range of applicability can be explored and expanded. So in terms of applicability domain, whether this model will work or not, uh, uh, because every model has its strengths and weaknesses. So this can be extended using a combination and integration of data from wet lab, and you predict those and send it to the wet lab. They experiment it, and then you fit into your model. So it's a interactive loop that should exist and often we call that as moist zone so it's not either dry or wet it's a combination of two so kind of the drug discovery hackathon problem statements so as you can see uh, uh, within the Campbell release there are 192 drugs that have been annotated as approved but they subsequently were withdrawn from the market for more than one reasons and uh, as you can see here, there most of the drugs are withdrawn because of hepatotoxicity and followed by cardiotoxicity and neurotoxicity. So if you look into closely to the uh, problem statements that we have in the drug discovery hackathon, there is a problem statement which is based on uh, general you know, toxicity models and ADME predictions. Then there are problem statements responding to cardiotoxicity and to hepatotoxicity, which is drug-induced liver injury. So, now we are talking about toxicity, and toxicity as such uh, is not an easy um, uh, domain to work with. Uh, but most of the time, uh, we have to keep in mind the, you know, the complexities as well as we have to simplify things so that we come up with the realistic estimation given the data and the objective of the problem. So this is a very simplistic representation of a toxicological network. There is a lot of other notes behind this, but you know, uh, it's, it's hard to cover everything in one lecture. So let's go through this network and try to understand. So from a chemical space, from drug chemical space, you have a drug that might bind to a protein or several proteins, and this interactions will affect the protein pathway interactions where some pathways can be up regulated or down regulated and thereby this regulations will result in some kind of uh, organ pathway interactions where you have you see the toxic effects in some tissues or organ system and sometimes this can be general that is causing a problem to everyone or it can be very much uh, uh, motivated by the phenotype of the population, so uh, resulting in ADRs, which are adverse drug reactions. So a good example would be Avacavir, which is an antiviral drug, uh, and this drug is basically sold with a box warning that if you are taking this drug, at some point you encounter some kind of fever, rashes, or reactions, you need to consult the doctor and stop taking it. It could be that you are uh, having a hypersensitive reactions which might result in multi-organ failure so this but this doesn't happen with all the drugs so like they say there is not one single drug that work for every population so we can also say with a toxic effect like that it can be very general to very specific and and sometimes this information is not so easy to attain 
So we know that these are the challenges. We need information in every node. We need data from omics and, and so on, population types, clinical data, to actually come to a realistic estimation of a toxicity profile of individual drug. But sadly, most of the time, this data is either scattered and not properly integrated, or, or sometimes this data are not shared. So uh, if we want to build a model which works perfectly and addresses everything with a realistic viewpoint, then as I said, it's an interdisciplinary science. A lot of uh, methods from different other science backgrounds should incorporate, as well as there has to be a proper uh, collaborative effort by the regulatory agency, pharmaceutical companies, academia, and so on to bring uh, such data which can be shared and which is the objective is a safer health, right? So, uh, and, and even though you know that this is a problem, we don't have always the best situation to work on, but uh, most of the time we have either information on two nodes, we have the information on the drugs, we know the proteins that are targeting, uh, the drugs that are targeting those proteins, and sometimes the pathways information, and we combine this, uh, you know, nodes uh, to come as close to the real estimation. So, um, and one should not be discouraged. Okay, we don't have all the data, so I should not work on it. That should not happen. Um, one should always start with whatever available, but one should know the risk associated with such models, the limitations and the strength of, of the model and the objective. So, um, so toxic, toxicity is um, uh, on the Tox uh, 21 platform is a platform that was initiated by uh, Environmental Protection Agency in US, and they realized that thousands of chemical substances exist in the world, but only a small fraction of this have been adequately assessed for the potential toxicity to humans. So this was very important. There are so many chemicals. We are interacting with chemicals every day, be it our food, be it in our medicines, or the clothes that we wear has, has chemicals in it. Uh, yet we don't know the risk profile of this chemical. That's that's scary because you know you you go to buy an apartment, you will basically know what is the risk associated with the cost that you're investing. And when it comes to chemical, I we have to be more careful. What are we going to fitting into our system as well as in our environment? So that has been like a motivation to it, and it is a unique collaboration between several federal agencies to develop new ways to rapidly test whether. Uh, substances will adversely affect a human health and also environment. And, and, and these substances can be commercial chemicals, pesticides or food and medical compounds. And as you can see, uh, the toxicity pathways uh, deals with the indirect cost of toxicity that can result in certain interactions. So most uh, primitive way of, uh, of toxic filter is that you believe or one believes that there is a, a functional group which is responsible in a chemical for toxicity like structural alerts or can be toxic or for, but it could also happen the chemical which pass away this filter, they do not have any structural information on their chemical uh, composition, but when they interact with targets which are involved in certain pathways, they can result in up and down regulations as explained before, and then they can result in cellular uh, toxicities and tissue and organ level. So uh, these are indirect. So in this case, the chemicals might be very clean chemical in terms of chemical structure, but they are very highly promised because they go and bind to all of the targets that are involved in toxicity pathways. So if you want to know more about it, you can just click into Tox21 and they have amazing, uh, amazing initiative as well as a lot of data that you can work on to predict different toxicity endpoints. Now coming to toxicity predictions and we, we talk, uh, we have been talking about it's an evolving science. It's, uh, it's like any other predictive science. It takes information from different levels and it's always a holistic approach where you in, you try to involve informations from bioinformatics, cheminformatics, metabolomics, proteomics, genomics and their interconnections. And uh, this is also a foundation of toxicity as such. So the computational toxicity prediction methods integrate all relevant informations on the structural or substructural analogs to make 
the assessment of potential toxicity. So you start with um, the measurement or calculation, then you have the context, then you generalize that knowledge, and of course you need to have the wisdom to know your model is, you know, how strong uh, in terms of performance and what are the limitations of your model. So when we talk about chemical structures and we talk about uh, doing computational modeling and we start with uh, uh, the first thing that we start with is the structure of a compound. How do we address them into, uh, uh, into a computer? So basically molecules can be visualized as a 3D quantum me mechanical object which consists of atoms with well-defined location within the molecule. So you see here are two molecules which uh, are presented in terms of molecular graph. And these two molecules can be compared based on their physiochemical or, uh, or the descriptor space. And one of the descriptors are SMILES. Uh, SMILE is a, a linear representation of the molecule and it stands for Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry. Besides the uh, slightly awkward sounding name, it is one of the most popular way of representing the molecule. In fact, some deep learning and machine learning models directly accept SMILES as input. So uh, this is uh, one of the format and the next one is, uh, yes, and one you should be also aware that SMILES representation does not produce information loss, so which is quite important for training machine learning models. And so features like length of atomic bonds and the 3D coordinate positions of the molecules are lost while converting the molecule into SMILE. So you will not have those information, right? So the second one is molecular fingerprints. The molecular fingerprints is just another way of numerically representing a molecule. The bit-like patterns, as you can see here, are generated um, and it indicates uh, an absence or presence of a certain substructures within a molecule. And the idea behind generating those patterns is a bit even uh, like, you know, critical, but I, I will uh, explain them, you know, briefly in the coming slides. So another way is uh, to do the molecular shape. As you can see, uh, taking the entire shape of the molecule as one descriptors, and then you have pharmacophores, which are the main, uh, you know, moieties that are involved in molecular recognition. So it's in 3D space. So once you have those uh, representation, you try to project them into a n-dimensional chemical descriptor space, and here, with the help of the descriptor values, you project them at two dots. The two compounds are present here, and you measure the similarity between the compounds by the distance they have in the chemical space. So if you have the two dots very close to each other, that means they are highly similar, and if they're far away, they are dissimilar. Now, molecular fingerprints applications, I'm talking more about this because this uh, descriptors will be highly used for prediction models that we have for the problem statement. So uh, the first thing that they're used for also similarity search. So given a toxic molecule, find similar ones and find dissimilar ones which also are toxic. Uh, we can use it for predictions given a set of toxic and non-toxic molecules build a model to predict which member forms a large collections will be toxic. And clustering, given a set of molecules with known activity, do they cluster into structural different groups? So you want to cluster the chemical space, you want to know how the chemicals look like, then you definitely use molecular fingerprints. So one of the most common molecular fingerprint is uh, extended connectivity fingerprint. It's basically assign each atom with an identifier and then it updates the entire atom identifier based on its neighbor. So it follows a neighborhood uh, identification behavior. Then it removes the duplicates and it folds the list of identifiers into you know, 2048 bit factor. And also uh, one of the, it's also called the circular fingerprints. And, and there is another one with small green fingerprints which work more or less in the same idea. So, uh, and another fingerprints which you can use or which mostly are used for predictions are pharmacophore 3D fingerprints where you take the pharmacophores and, and you decide the geometric features, presence or absence, and you take the pairs of atoms and uh, at a given distance, uh, 
often triplet of atoms associated with distance with the pharmacophoric features. And, and it also takes care of the valence and torsion angles that are involved in the uh, chemical structures. So at the end, you put them into a bit vector representations and you compare two different chemicals based on those. How many bits are set to one and, and zero. So we're talking about chemical similarity. Why is it so important? Like molecule measures of structural similarity underlie many processes in chemical informatics. So if you look in chemical informatics, this is a most simplistic and a most important uh, concept is to use chemical similarity. So they are measured based on 2D fingerprints and Tanimoto coefficient, which is a distance matrix to perform the similarity. And uh, even though they're simple, they have given they performed really well in several uh, contexts. And another way is also to use fusion methods where you can combine the results obtained from different measures. So that is also uh, quite applicable in some forms of chemical similarity. Now we're coming to chemical similarity and, and I must say what is um, a chemical similarity is a very subjective question, right? So they say that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder and so is the chemical similarity. So based on the perspective, based on the objective that you are addressing, this results can differ. Now, if I have to ask you what is the uh, similar compounds here, and depending on what similarity you're looking for, you will group them into different groups. And probably uh, if you're looking at the similarity measure of shape, then you are going to group them in this way, cluster them this way. And if you're looking for color, then you have a different cluster. And if you're looking for size and you have a different cluster and then you have a pattern, you have a different cluster. So, you know, so what is similar is a subjective thing. So one has to be very clear with the objective that one is looking for. Now, when we look into the chemical similarity space of, uh, of the chemical uh, data, here we have 16 diverse aldehyde derivatives. And as you can see, they are all uh, in this chemical space and we need to find the similar compounds. Well, if I have to group them based on common scaffolds, then you can group them into four clusters. As you can see, they follow the same scaffold system here. And if the similarity measure was on the functional group, then obviously this molecule and this molecule and this one and this one will group into together, all with the chlorine will group into one cluster and so on. So as you can see, chemical similarity even with the same chemical space can result in different results depending on what we're looking for. So why is uh, molecular similarity so important? Much of chemistry is based on structural analogs and would be very difficult if they were not the case. So more formally, the similarity property principle states that structural similar molecule tends to have similar properties a uh, classical case is morphine, codeine, and heroin, where you know they are all painkillers and they have a similar kind of activity. However, one must uh, also remember that similarity is not unambiguous. It depends on the type of molecular representation and the similarity measure and metrics that have been used. So uh, depending on different molecular representations and similarity metrics, the results in different values. So as you can see here, even though uh, these two compounds, which are having a highly similar fingerprints, but based on other descriptive values, when they are projected onto the chemical space, there is a high, there's a great distance between them, which tells that they are dissimilar. So coming to uh, computational models and then how, uh, how our machine learning models are helping with computational toxicity predictions. So with the increase of computational power, machine learning models has found many applications in different fields of science. One of them is chemistry and where scientists apply machine learning models to predict values and molecular properties such as solubility and toxicity or use it for drug discovery. So quickly, uh, uh, these are the data sets which are very focused on toxicity. So uh, Toxinate is a database from the EPA, which is um, having a large amount of data. And you have Toxcast, Tox21, Tox and, and Admit SAR, super toxic stage, which has data on you know, side effects and, 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 
different interaction profiles of chemical. So uh, quickly, I'm just going to tell you about um, the most used, uh, you know, machine learning models or methods in this field are um, support vector machine, random forest, and, you know, nearest neighbor approach, neural network, convolutional, uh, convolution graph network. And sometimes uh, each of this model have their own strength and weaknesses. So you need to combine the strength of each model and then also can predict as an ensemble model. So this is um, important. However, just to stretching a little bit on the neural network, especially recurrent neural network, um, it really works with SMILES as a representation of the molecule. Since SMILES uh, um, is a text-based representation, RNNs can be, uh, can be used to predict another molecule in that sequence. It allows generating new SMILES sequence, which might help in finding molecules with desirable properties or undesirable properties with example, like filtering the toxic molecules. What is more important is that um, uh, it is quite difficult to uh, problem to generalize RNNs uh, or CNNs to take a graph as an input, which can often be the case while working with molecules. So what graph convolution uh, method does is uh, solve this problem by taking, um, by taking molecular graphs and their features as input, and uh, more specifically, uh, these graphs mm -hmm. together with features of each atoms are converted into matrix form, and then they are plugged into the neural network model. So you see, not always uh, each of the model has to result in prediction of the, you know, the endpoint. Some models can also help us to convert the a feature set into something that can be an input for the other model. So I'm not getting too much detail into each of the models that will be beyond the scope of this talk. So if you're interested, there are a lot of materials online. You can go more deeper and 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 see how you can use them. So just a general idea of what's happening on a regular uh, project with training um, model with machine learning. So you have a training data, you train the model, you evaluate the solutions on the test data, and if it passes, then you just use and deploy the model. But if it fails, it's very important to analyze the errors. Why is it failing? Study the problem and the process starts again. Uh, most of the cases while well, dealing with toxicity data, you will have a raw data. The data is never given to you uh, as, a, as a standard data. So there's a lot of work that goes into this field where you have to clean the data, standardize them so that they can be used for the model. And, and many of the time people neglect doing that because they feel that it's not the most important thing. But I think uh, data cleansing and standardization is the most important part of the model building. So anytime you have a good data, anyone can build a model but it's not the other way around. So uh, you must focus on how the data set is curated and there's a lot of domain knowledge and expertise and experience goes into it. And then you have, uh, then you need to select the right discriminative features which can, uh, you know, differentiate the both classes easily. Uh, in this case, it's a binary classification. So you will have an active and inactive class. And then you train the model in, uh, whichever molecular or modeling uh, methods you want to use, and then you cross validate and, and do a test um, set evaluation. So this uh, will be very specific to the problem statements that you have. Now, like I told you about the regular traditional fingerprints that are used, but sometimes it can happen that those fingerprints are not performing in the optimal way. So what you can do, this is more uh, uh, specialized, but if you play around with the fingerprints, you will know how they're designed and how you can also come up with innovative ideas to use that fingerprints to the best benefits of your model to come up with a very good result and prediction. So uh, this is an example where you take the smiles of uh, a substructural fingerprints, which is called Max, and you create a, a smile a fingerprint out of it what you do is that you try to see which features, because every fingerprint has a feature in, encoded in it, 
And some of the features will be very frequent in your active class and other features will be, you know, uh, frequent in inactive class. So you do a propensity score, you select the features, you encode them into a new fingerprint, which are more specific to the active class, and then you train your model to use that information. And uh, for drug-induced liver injury, this uh, process has worked really well. Another fingerprint approach that you can try while solving the problem is a hybrid fingerprint. So you can, so every methods as well as every features have their strength and weaknesses. So one can also combine different fingerprints like max, connectivity fingerprints. There is another fingerprints called tox print, substructure fingerprints. Even you can encode the descriptors of chemicals into a binary bit string format and use it as a fingerprint representation. So all of this you can concatenate into a new fingerprint and you can feed your model and try to predict the outcomes. Uh, it's highly difficult to say which works or which is the best fingerprint. It's always depending on the data and the problem that you're addressing. So most of the time, it's also important to know your data, to know uh, what kind of chemical space you are dealing with. So chemical space network is a very important topic when it comes to modeling and also to check the applicability domain of your model. So typically, uh, chemical space is, uh, is seen as a set of molecular points distributed with uh, multidimensional space, much as the stars and planets are dispersed throughout the universe. So as you can see here, and, and this uh, chemical space are based on similarity-based compound network representations, and the vertices are colored with um, according to the potency of the compound. So the red being highly potent and yellow being moderate and green with low potency. So you can also, also if you don't have the potency values, you can also um, encode the structures with the probability of your predictions, so how strongly these are predicted, how weakly these are predicted, so on. And the ages indicates the pairwise fingerprint uh, relationship. So the pairwise comparison, so depending on how um, similar they are, the ages will be stronger or wider. Another way uh, is to also do for, for example, uh, with this liver toxic drugs, the positive drugs were, uh, were visualized using a chemical space analysis where you can see uh, each of the colors are the clusters that shows uh, how conserved these drugs are or not. And then you can obviously see uh, by pictorial representations how these drugs are compared to the immediate neighbor and what is the Tenimoto score between them. So a Tenimoto score of zero means they are not identical and one is they're highly identical. Uh, you could also use uh, chemical space uh, based on heat map of similarity, pairwise similarity features. Here is a heat map from a natural compound uh, data comparison where you have two compounds and when you click into the red being highly similar and the yellow or the white being non-similar. So there, these are the important things because if you are working on a chemical data and you have to play with your data, you have to know the strength of this data set and the weakness of the data set. And of course, when you train your model, the more you interact with the data, you also know what kind of features will work. And that reduces, this experience reduces your time that you need to build a model. And it's very important. One of the most important thing that you will come across is imbalanced data set. Like any machine learning algorithms, uh, uh, you know, they work all very good with samples uh, where you have equal distributions of the classes. But in most of the toxicity related problems, you will uh, run into uh, imbalanced chemical data set where one class is the majority class, as you can see here, and and uh, one class is the minority class, and this is uh, really not a very uh, nice, uh, you know, uh, situation to work. But this is the case, so you should be familiar with that. You will see even in the problem statement that we have uh, given in this drug discovery hackathon, the, the there is a case of imbalanced data set. And most of the time, the minority class is oftentimes the class of interest. So you will have, for example, the ones which are toxic are always the minority class, and, and that is something one has to handle while building a model. Uh, quickly, just quick information for the starters, what you can do when you have an imbalanced data set. 
change the performance metrics and evaluate your model with very strict metrics which can tell you a, a real estimation of your model. Change the algorithm if, you know, if uh, random forests mostly are known to work really good with imbalanced data set, but also like, you know, other algorithms are there. Uh, you can resample the uh, data, so you can oversample the minority class, or you can undersample the majority class. Here, of course, you have information loss and you have to be aware of that. And you can also generate synthetic samples and, and, and there are different ways to generate them with different distance matrix and uh, like Tenimoto and value difference matrix. But these are more specific. So uh, for the starters, I think uh, if, you, if you change the performance matrix and the algorithm and resampling techniques, this should be a good um, estimation to know if certain uh, you know, changes in this um, uh, process can help you to even you know, predict the imbalanced data set better. And then if you are comfortable with doing that, then you go to more specific uh, techniques. So coming to performance matrix. So one of the most uh, or highly accepted is AUC ROC curve, which is uh, at each point of this rock curve, you correspond to a ratio between the true positives and false positives and according to a discriminative threshold and, and, and the rock curve is a probability that a classifier rank a positive higher than a negativity or negative class. Mm, it's used even for imbalanced classes, so uh, one can use that. As you can see here, this blue line is a reflective of a great model, which is not always the case. So uh, and, and, and the red line is a good model. Um, and the green line is uh, is a car in the scar is a reflective of a bad model and beyond that is obviously you should not consider a model. So it's good for visualization and model comparison even when you're doing uh, uh, with different algorithms or different folds of uh, validation. So uh, there are classical parameters which are sensitivity, specificity, balance accuracy where you divide uh, both sensitivity and specificity. Um, you mean them. One important factor is that, uh, I mean, it's, it depends on the problem that you're addressing. So whether you want your model to be very sensitive or specific, it is, again, different problems. For example, in clinical models, the sensitivity is a very important factor. However, when it comes to toxicity-based models, uh, uh, a, a lower gap between the sensitivity and specificity is desired. So if you have a specificity and sensitivity, which is having very less gap between them, then you know uh, this is a real estimate. It's not unbiased, uh, uh, it's not a biased model. Another uh, uh, performance matrix is precision, negative predictive value. Uh, I'm not getting, going to details about it. Uh, everyone knows that, you can really uh, read them. Uh, so F score, which is also used most of the time, it's a harmonic mean of precision and recall. So often criticized because they do not take true negative into account. So this is one of the reasons. So if you want F score based uh, per evaluation, then you have to be aware that true negatives are not into, taken into consideration. Uh, I can uh, really suggest uh, using this uh, MCC uh, performance metrics. It's the measure of quality of binary classifications, which are which is most of the questions that we have for drug discovery hackathon as binary classifications. So you have correlation coefficient between observed and predicted classifications. Um, this returns a value between minus one and one, where 0.5 means that 75% of the cases are correctly predicted. So uh, for imbalanced data set, this would be a nice uh, or, or acceptable parameter to evaluate the model. So, if you are, uh, you know, thinking of uh, solving the problems that we have in drug discovery hackathon, please uh, use this parameter to evaluate the model. Now, uh, one of the most important thing is that uh, this hackathon has a aim or objective in mind where it encourages everyone, uh, even if you're not from the computational background, to participate and learn 
and see if you want to work in this field. I think this is a very good initiative. So uh, given that, if you are not really sure if you like programming at this point or not, but you want to participate, so don't restrict yourself. Um, there is a platform called Nine, which is uh, very user friendly. It's an open source data analytic platform, uh, which integrate different knowledge in terms of nodes. So you don't have you don't have to program. You just need to know how to work on it and the basic approach, right? So it has various components where you have machine learning, data mining, and and it's like a pipeline concept. So as you can see here, uh, most of the uh, you know, uh, nodes or extensions are open source. They don't charge you. Only uh, nine server and partners extensions, which are from commercial partners, are chargeable. So you, if you want to look, uh, have a look into it, just go to nine.com and go through it. And I'm telling you, even if you're from non-programming background, you will find it very easy to work on this uh, platform. So I've I'm quickly giving you an example of a workflow node. This is a very simple representation, but this is to encourage uh, all the uh, uh, people who have not done programming, but also want to work in this field. So you can start with uh, a simple uh, workflow where you read a file. Uh, in this case, it's a training set and, and test set. If you have uh, not divided them previously, you can also use the partitioning uh, node to partition them into training and test set. And then you can create fingerprints using this node. And as you can see, you're not going to write a code. You just have to connect the nodes and create the fingerprints. It's as easy as it can be. And then you can use the right model. If it is random forest and you train the model, you can do a cross validations and, and the score is actually your performance matrix, which kind of gives you a fair idea how is how well is a model is being trained. And then um, there is a rock curve uh, nodes and you can predict the test data and you can also see how your models are performing on test data. Uh, similarly, you can use uh, different algorithms as you can see here, uh, decision tree. Uh, besides using machine learning models and all other chemical or cheminformatics nodes, uh, this gives a very good way to uh, you know, visualize your data. As I've told you before, the visualization is very important. So you can also use nodes like Color Manager where you encode certain active classes with different colors and you visualize them into chemical space. You can use bar chart, you can use scatter plot. And, and of course, uh, there are nodes for statistics where you can do different uh, uh, statistic um, computations on your data set to have a good idea. So if you are... Uh, new to NIME and you want to train yourself, and this is what is the opportunity that uh, uh, the Drug Discovery Hackathon is providing. So Teach Open uh, is, a, is a platform in NIME which is mainly devoted to computational aided drug discovery. So it's a teaching platform where um, it consists of eight workflows and each one contains one topic in computer aided drug design. Uh, the pipeline is currently illustrated using epidermal growth factor, but can be easily applied to any targets or any problems. So uh, I would highly encourage you to download this. It's uh, it's done by one of my colleagues at University of Berlin. It's uh, it's it's actually done by the students for the students. So you know the de uh, the design protocol is as easy as it could be to self train yourself. So all that you need to do is to download the nine workflow and just uh, you know uh, uh, start working on it because everything is designed you just need to press the button and see how it works and then probably start uh, forming new questions or new workflows depending on your interest uh, if you are you know if you're from a computer science background and you're not familiar with chemoinformatics or you know, biological systems or toxicology and such, then you can use, um, you know, you're aware of Python programming libraries where you have um, uh, SKLearn, where different types of methods are there, classifications, regressions, clustering, and so on. So uh, you can look into it, and there are different uh, ways that you can script them using uh, 
especially uh, the RD kit, which is a chemoinformatics library. It is basically written in C++ and Python. Some of the functionality includes reading and writing of molecules, substructure search, chemical informations, and, and, and transformation of chemical space, molecular similarity. Uh, personally, I've struggled, uh, like, you know, uh, installing it in my laptop, but I would suggest if you're installing them, use a Conda installation, which works perfectly for, uh, for installation. And when it comes to other, another package, which is TipCam, which is highly popular, it's well-maintained Python library with over 1.7K. Start at hit, hit up, GitHub, sorry. It provides open source tool chain for deep learning and drug discovery, quantum chemistry, and other life sciences. So there is a lot of open source materials which gives you uh, to learn and self uh, self train yourself in this field. And don't be uh, scared of trying them. Um, they are very well documented. So if you have any doubts or anything, you can always uh, uh, there's a, there are also user group for RDKit where you can post your queries and they try to answer you and 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 that's how I have learned that's how everyone learns so go and try this out. So if you are you know familiar with Python and you want to start with Python programming, then the Teach Open module is also uh, available on Python uh, packages. So it's freely accessible. Uh, it's already published in uh, Journal of Chem Informatics. And uh, you can use this step-by-step uh, -step tutorials. And it's, it, as I said, uh, like nine, this is more on the programming. And you have different tasks where you have data acquisition from Campbell. So how to get a data from a database. So you have a you know, um, workflow or task on that. Then you have molecular filtering, the admic criteria, like if there are pain substructure or substructural alerts and so on. Um, the unwanted structures uh, filter. Then you have ligand based screening compound similarity. So you basically check which of the fingerprints work on your chemical space. And then you have compounds clustering. You cluster the compounds and see, visualize them. You have maximum common substructures to see how much of these compounds have common substructure, uh, substructure. And then this is a pairwise comparison. Uh, you have ligand based screening, uh, which is for machine learning, so you can see, you can train a random forest model with the script and know exactly how it works. And then you have uh, data acquisition from PDB, so you can download the data using the script and, and then you can do a ligand based or structure based pharmacophores, as you can see here. And then uh, uh, the task stand involves a binding site comparison. There are many uh, uh, tools probably there which are focused on CAT, but I must tell you that when it comes to training or teaching, this is a very good resource. And for starters, uh, even if you're not from a you know programming background, you can use a NIME node. And uh, if you are from familiar with Python and scripting, then definitely uh, you can use this. And they come with uh, interactive uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, um, present uh, with topics presented in them. So you can integrate both the theoretical knowledge and you can have a practical session uh, on those theoretical knowledge that you've learned. So and uh, by that, I've come to the third part of my talk. So we talked about computational toxicity. We talked about the risk associated with it. We know the weaknesses. We know the challenges and so on. And given that, uh, there are still some servers which are um, applicable or open to the uh, academic uh, researchers to use them. And one of them is Prodox. And uh, currently, it has 40 uh, predictive models. So what happens there is that you take a molecule in, as input structure and it tries to predict the acute toxicity, the organ toxicity, toxicological endpoints, which can be carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, and so on. And then you have the toxicity pathways where you have 12 different pathways and you know if, if this compound is active in this pathway or not. And then you have uh, toxicity targets, which are targets which might be an off target and you want to know if your compound will bind to them or interact with them. So uh, one good part of mm, this kind of sketch is that irrespective of predicting the compound for different toxicity endpoints, it also helps you to understand what could be the molecular event underlying such interactions. 
So most of the time, you people we are not aware of this. So once you see that, okay, there is a connection there, maybe we must investigate more deeper into that connection. It comes up with new observations and new results. Another web server which is highly uh, popular too is Admit SAR, which is uh, focused on Admit uh, properties. They have 37 models for different toxicity endpoints. Besides that, they have also their own database. So uh, you can also search compounds um, by different search criteria like common name and, and so on. And then they have toxicity predictions, they have uh, cytochrome predictions, pipeline, and similarity search. Uh, so try this out, whatever you uh, are learning in this or the information that you're getting in this uh, session, you can actually try yourself while using those servers, uh, how those theoretical concepts are implemented in a practical uh, way. Uh, another server is uh, for metabolic uh, activities profiling. Um, and there are, uh, it's called SuperSAP Pred. It's basically um, depends on cytochrome 450 interactions. So there are 10 models for SIP isoforms, uh, which are responsible for 90% of the drug's metabolism. So what does SuperSIP does is try, try to create model based on the data and predict the models using different fingerprints. And, and uh, this has been shown with color-coded uh, probability score. And also the applicability domain of the model is visualized using uh, the heat map or similarity methods. And then you also have drug drug interaction profile. So we talked about this, uh, you know, most of the time uh, people do get multiple therapy and they have different chemicals which they take at the same time. So if we want to know if there are, uh, you know, combinations of drugs that might bind to the same cytochromes and results and some side effects. So drug drug interactions are again another domain of uh, you know specific domain of understanding the side effects. So uh, through super SIP, it tries to uh, predict uh, as well as it has curated uh, knowledge from literature where they combine a score and tells you if this drug drug interaction is not the favorable one. And in case if this is not the favorable one, what can you uh, use instead of this drug? So they try to uh, suggest an, uh, another drug from the same ADC class, which can be resulting in favorable drug combinations. Of course, this is uh, something that people should not uh, take it. If they have to take the drugs, they should consult with the doctors. But this is just to give you a view that, okay, there is a most probable cytochrome interactions that are happening with a combination of this drug. So in short, uh, we talked about computational toxicity or toxicology. So we do have a lot of uh, things that has to be taken into consideration apart from machine learning and you know chemoinformatics. So I think the most important one is data mining. It's um, the data is very scattered. It's not integrated in the right way. So we need to have a proper descriptions and you know uh, relational. Um, data standards which integrate the knowledge from different databases or different sources. And some of the data are also not shared. So that is also one challenge. So, um, so, so data mining part is very important. You have the chemical space part, which you have QSR modeling, where you have chemical properties, structural descriptors, and we talked about similarity metrics and um, other statistical methods. You have toxico cheminformatics, where you Consider the chemogenomic profiles of the of the data. You consider chemical diversity as well as the neighborhood behavior of the chemicals. So you know if if there are immediate neighbors which also follow the same trend or not. And then of course you have the biological profiling, which is uh, the toxicogenomic studies, metabolomics, and a mode of action. So there's a lot of information that is uh, needed to come up with the right predictive toxicology, but you know, as they say, whatever you have, you should to start. You should start with that. And 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 in this case, in the problem statements that we have, we have the chemical data, and we know for their endpoints whether they're toxic or non-toxic, and and we need to start with that for now. Um, I would like to end this talk with a, you know, a, a representation that I feel is very closely related to 
machine learning and especially with uh, dealing with data, which are drugs and clinical data. So you have a knowledge, you have experience, and obviously the next beautiful cat that is drawn is creativity. But if you have a model which is so creative, I, I would doubt that model if it is overfitted or not. So if you encounter a model which is so perfect, then you must be very careful. You need to validate them. You need to know, uh, validate using different folds and different performance metrics. So that's not really the case. There's always a limitation of a model. A model cannot be 100% perfect. So you must be aware of that. So having said that, I'm almost done. So thank you for listening. I hope some of the important pointers that we try to give in this practical session uh, might help you or encourage you to go ahead and solve the problem statements that we have uh, in the field of toxicity predictions in the drug discovery hackathon. And I hope that you also find this research area interesting and, and start or want to start working on it. And I uh, have to thank uh, Dr. Avey for uh, for such a good initiative for motivating all of us to come together and form this, uh, you know, problem statements and and seeing and uh, having a vision to see that how we can connect to a wide range of students across India who can be motivated and encouraged to participate in drug discovery uh, platform. And of course, uh, Professor Dr. Sastri for uh, taking care of the training module, arranging everything. So thank you for uh, your contribution. I uh, have to thank Dr. Papri Banerjee who has been coordinating this hackathon. It's a very hard job and she's trying to coordinate with all of us. So I really appreciate her contribution. I had the pleasure and privilege to work with uh, closely with Dr. Sinivas Aungandi and Dr. Uh, Arjun Ray uh, on different problem statements and, and also sharing ideas. So it was very helpful. Um, so uh, Dr. Anshu Bharatwaj is also one of the main coordinators of uh, this hackathon. It's doing a credible job. And, um, and Dr. Nagmani who's uh, coordinating with Dr. Mahanta and uh, Dr. Sharma on this uh, training model. So I'm really thankful for them to do it in such a nice way. And um, of course, I'm missing out many members. So I would like to thank all of the team members uh, who are involved, uh, as well as the leaderships and everyone uh, who's involved in the drug discovery hackathon. And uh, last but not the list, I have to thank uh, Dr. Pryson and Kubler from Shari Day who have always supported me to participate in causes like this. So I'm thankful to them. With that, I would like to end my presentation here and I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Priyanka. It was a really wonderful session. Uh, and we have a huge number of questions but uh, due to the time limit, we will stick to some of the best questions that we have gathered. So uh, I will now hand over to Mr. Lijo. He will put some questions and you can take those questions and just answer to them. Sure. Over to Lijo. Okay, over to Lijo then. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Priyanka. It was a nice Hello. lecture. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we have a few questions and uh, I'll put the first question. The first question was uh, is uh, from Mr. Mohit Mehta and uh, he asked, uh, using computational toxicology, how can we identify adverse drug reaction that can happen to various organs? Okay, um, that's a very nice question and I think um, it's an important question and, and also very hard question to answer. <laughs> so I must say um, there are different ways to encounter this and I can give you a subjective, uh, you know, um, uh, answer from a project that I worked with. I think I've referenced that uh, the story of Avakavir with ADR. So, so this is a very well uh, you know, documented and well researched area. So what we did was we tried to use computational techniques to, you know, work on several other class from the same ADC code that is from the antiviral section that could also result in similar kind of ADRs uh, depending on their similarity and and also uh, the uh, you know similarity neighborhood behavior. So 
We did come across, by this method, we did come across a drug called acyclovir, which also have uh, shows a similar kind of interactions with the HLA antigen uh, that is involved in this ADRs. But however, uh, this does not produce uh, the side effects as strongly or, or as uh, seriously as, as in the case of avacavir. So one has to also understand sometimes the ad uh, adverse drug reactions are idiosyncratic. So we really don't know how it will happen, how it has happened, unless it happens. And then we investigate in more details with depending on the, um, on the, on the information that we have in hand. So yes, uh, it is possible, but it is also important that we have more information on every level of the nodes. If you go back to the toxicological network, yes, we need information uh, uh, from a prior similar event so that we can connect those points. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. That was a nice explanation. Uh, I move on to the next question, and uh, it is from uh, Kadambari Wanarsri. And uh, her question is, uh, please comment on the wet lab toxicity testing data by machine learning methods as well as uh, on the future of toxicology. <laughs> well, I, I, well, this is a very good question. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, if I would say to her that if she's interested to work in this field. We need more people to work in this field so that we get more grants to do more research and experiment them. So uh, coming to toxicity data, which are uh, you know validated in wet lab, for example, you have the tox21 data. Of course, uh, you know, if we say wet lab, always the wet lab is not the standard, but we have to also question that critically. But given uh, relatively, this is a very good chemical space to work with, um, you know, uh, to work uh, on machine learning models and several groups and several researchers have worked on them and it works uh, really good with the data set. So if she's interested, she can look into this. Uh, there are 12 endpoints uh, and, and, um, and on the future of toxicology. I think uh, the future of toxicology is depending on us, how much we question uh, what we uh, uh, are taking on a regular level, uh, the chemicals that we uh, are their presence in our food, uh, the chemicals that we take as a you know drug to treat ourselves so i think awareness is very important and also uh, encouragement of people who work in this field so i see um, if there is a drug discovery there has to be a very good research of toxicology it goes both ways it has to be both ways it has to be balanced yeah ma'am uh, i'll take the last question for today yeah. And the uh, question is raised by uh, Sachin Suryan, who asks, uh, if we find a molecule fit for all other parameters for drug discovery, yeah. and if it is toxic, if we find it to be toxic, how can we optimize it? Uh, can you can you please rephrase the questions? Can you come again, once again? Yeah, I, I'll come again. If we find a molecule, uh, whose mm -hmm. all other parameters are fit or mm -hmm. good for drug discovery, but mm -hmm. if it is found to be toxic, then mm -hmm. how can we optimize some of the toxic uh, parameters? Yeah, so uh, the question is really interesting because it's not helpful to know, okay, this is toxic. The next step as also the future of toxicology is like how to improve even this toxic compound so that we have a better you know outcome and more safer chemicals so uh, first question is uh, you have to know at which endpoints this is toxic is the toxic related to a structure of the compound or is it related to the target proteins and and or is it uh, it's a compound that is activated in some toxicity pathway so depending on the endpoints i think measure has to be taken so if it is a functional group which is responsible for toxicity so you need to change that functional group into uh, 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 into another group that would probably retain the same uh, you know interaction profiles in terms of drug likeliness but also reduce the toxicity profile of the compound yeah, thank you very much, ma'am, for all the explanations. I really hope that people will find it really useful for their studies and for their research. And uh, I will give back uh, the mic to Dr. Mahanta. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, I must say these were not the only questions. There were a lot of them, <laughs> but uh, these were the ones that we could pick at this uh, time.